I think we are ready to begin. So hello and welcome everyone to today's EG webinar, which is called What the Media Wants to Hear From You. I'm Gillian D'Souza and I lead media relations at the European Geosciences Union. This webinar will run for about 45 minutes to an hour and will include time for questions at the end. I will now proceed to read a brief discussion uh, or description of today's talk. So in today's EG webinar, we will explore the kinds of science stories that journalists want to cover, the support and preparation that they need from scientists to tell a compelling story, and how to have an effective two-way dialogue to share your science with the wider public. The webinar will also explore the many ways that a researcher might encounter a journalist, um, either through their institution's press office or through someone reading a preprint or maybe while presenting or attending a conference. Uh, it will also offer tips on how to best prepare for these media interactions. We are joined today by our guest speaker, Anonio Bhattacharya. Welcome, Anonio. Hi, um, thank you. So Thanks Anonio is a science writer based in London. During a 15-year career in journalism, he has worked at publications including Nature, the Economist and Chemistry World, covering everything from science policy and bibliometrics to genetics and particle physics. Before journalism, he was a medical researcher at the Burnham Institute in San Diego, California. He holds a degree in physics from the University of Oxford and a PhD in protein crystallography from Imperial College London. His first book, the Man from the Future, The Visionary Ideas of John von Neumann was published in 2021 and was a Financial Times and TLS Book of the Year. So very exciting um, a session ahead, clearly. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to share with all of you just a little bit about why we're doing this webinar in the first place. Um, this is one of EGU's many recent attempts to bridge the gap between scientists and journalists. If you're wondering what this gap is and why it exists, uh, I would just like to briefly show you some background information for context. So I will now share my screen. So um, just about why this communication gap even exists and what it's about, studies have shown that many scientists perceive dealing with the media as a delicate task that can lead to improper quotations or misrepresentations of research results. And in a recently concluded uh, media survey that was conducted and organized by EGU, we learned from journalists, both in Europe and beyond, that they have experienced during their interactions with scientists, that scientists, even though they are eager and willing to talk to the media, they often do not follow through on media requests. The reasons could be varied, um, and scientists have often cited a lack of time, other commitments, they do not consider themselves a subject matter expert, or they are unwilling or unable to discuss findings before they are published. Probably you might find yourself being familiar with some or all of these reasons. Um, now, one of the reasons why there's this um, gap is, and also because of why there's so much of, um, you know, so many instances of misrepresentation or maybe quotes that have gone wrong is because of this increasing pressure on scientists to provide newsworthy or controversial or surprising stories. And there's also similar pressure on journalists to provide more scientific stories in a less or short amount of time. So as a result, um, there are sometimes inaccuracies that occur in scientific reporting, although these are maybe far and few in between, moderate and unintentional. Um, they can be frequently found in even renowned media outlets. And you know there's a lot of published research on this as well. Now, sure, um, all of this might sound intimidating, but EGU would like to encourage you um, to still persist in your efforts to communicate with and to talk to the media. Why is this? Um, at uh, a 2020 panel discussion, which was held at um, Oregon State University, um, Claire Couch, who was a PhD student at, at the time, um, had some very interesting thoughts and insights to share about this. And Claire said that scientists need to be bilingual. That is, they need to be able to speak the language of science and of lay people. What Claire said is that many researchers have incredibly important messages to share with the public, but often lack the skills and resources to make their communication efforts successful. But 
all scientists have a responsibility to make their science relevant, understandable, and memorable for the public and for decision makers. So um, without further ado, I think a good place to start for all of us would be to understand what the media even wants to hear from us as scientists and how we can help them in this, um, in this endeavor to collaborate better. So um, that's your cue, Anonio, to um, begin your talk. Feel free to share your slides. And then, of course, we'll have a question and answer um, session towards the end. So over to you. Right. Um, thank you very much, Shilin. So uh, this has solved the problem. Thanks. Um, and um, so, yes, uh, so my talk is going to be about what the media wants and doesn't want um, to hear from you scientists. So a little bit about me first. Um, I'm on a no. Um, yeah, I, I did my undergraduate degree in physics and I have a PhD in biophysics, which if it means anything to anybody out there was in protein crystallography. And I, I even did a postdoc in medical research at the Burnham Institute in La Jolla. And for three years, I was wedded to research and then we got an amicable divorce. Um, I went on to do a master's in science communication at Imperial College and I spent about 15 years in science journalism working at various publications but I suppose the ones that are most relevant um, to our audience um, is that I was news editor and then chief online editor at Nature, and I was also a science correspondent at The Economist, which uh, had a science section and still has a science section that many scientists admired, and indeed I did too, uh, when I was a PhD student. I finally left The Economist in uh, January 2019 to write The Man from the Future, which, uh, which was published in October 2021 and is available in all good bookshops. Please buy it. Um, and I am, oh, how did that get there? There we are. I am currently a self-employed writer. Now, I said the talk would be about, begin with what the media don't want. And believe it or not, what they don't want is this which is hype um now why do i say that well back in 2011 i wrote an article for the guardian that was entitled scientists should not be allowed to copy check stories about their work um this didn't go down very well with scientists my argument was that science journalism was um, in essence, no different from any other area of journalism. Now, can you imagine asking a political reporter to share their story with a source? Right. Yes, Mr. Johnson. Of course, you can see what I'm going to write about the parties that you had in number 10. It just it just wouldn't happen. So why would scientists expect to be treated any differently? Um and that score that so that was the first point and then um i explored the idea uh, as to whether sharing a story is actually conducive to good journalism um and and whether stories that have been passed um you know the scientists that actually uh who did the work which we're reporting on whether that actually made the story more readable or more accurate um so scientists thought that i was trolling them and one of them, who was a neuroscientist called Chris Chambers, he responded with an article arguing that scientists should be allowed to check stories. And this kicked off um, quite dramatically, and it ended up leading to a debate at the Royal Institution. Now, Chris's article, which was about twice as long as mine, I should I should add, um, argued obviously that scientists should be able to check um, a journalist copy. And his argument was that that is because science is fundamentally different from other areas that journalists cover, like politics or sport. 
And um, his argument ran um, something like this. First, um, peer review is special. Um, science has peer review. Politicians don't get peer reviewed. Um, and the whole process of peer review allows all mistakes and exaggerations to be spotted early on. Journalists aren't themselves qualified uh, to spot those mistakes anyway. And it also acts as a sort of uh, break on scientists so that you know they don't um, hype up their own results. Uh, his second point was um, the data in a paper and the paper itself, which is after all supposed to be the source material, that's open to scrutiny by anyone. And this should also work as uh, a curb for you know any wild claims that a scientist might be tempted to make. You know, they know that uh, there's a research paper that anybody can access. And so therefore, um, they that should keep them in line, right? And then lastly, um, he made the point that he, he didn't think scientists had anything to gain from press coverage. I mean, after all, he said, um, you know, we depend on citations and grants, and neither of those really depend on uh, getting our story covered in the Daily Telegraph. So overall, what Chris argued was that scientists don't have any incentive to exaggerate. Um, or distort their own story. So the inaccuracies that are in um, these stories must be down to journalists. Now, these were, or at least they felt like extremely convincing reasons. The problem was that it turned out that they were not true. Um, so Chris's article didn't go down well with journalists, just as my article <laughs> didn't go down very well with scientists. But as he met more of us, he realized that actually maybe, just maybe journalists weren't the problem. Newspapers were understaffed and they, they still are. Um, and uh, reporters on some of the dailies, they were expected to write five or six stories a day. And they didn't have time to make stuff up. Um, and so he thought, is there a bigger problem here that uh, we need to address? What if journalists were in fact acting as mouthpieces for scientists already? Now, you know, how does how does that make sense? Well, he said, well, what if what journalists are actually doing is just churning out copy that's not based on the paper or even any conversation they might have with researchers because often they just simply didn't have time to phone anybody up but they were simply regurgitating what they read in the press release for the research could it be well um you know could it be he uh, he asked that the hype that got scientists in a tears was already in the press release now he did something to his credit that any good scientist should should do. He went and got himself a big grant and then he studied the problem and uh, he had a road to Damascus moment. And his research, um, which was uh, published, his uh, first paper, which was published almost uh, a decade ago, confirmed exactly this that in almost all cases, or in the, in the large majority of cases anyway, when news stories made claims beyond those that were made in the peer-reviewed journal article, those exaggerations were nearly always present in the university press release. And the correlation was really very striking. And then in a later study, he found that the same pattern repeated itself in press releases that were issued by journals. And then one of those rare, rare things happened a couple of years afterwards, which is that there was an independent replication of Chris's results. Now, how did, how did that happen? Well, um, a Dutch study had looked at science coverage in the Netherlands, and it found the same thing. So now we're really building this 
strong case that, that Chris's sus suspicion that essentially science journalists were parroting um, uh, university press le releases and repeating the mistakes are in them rather than adding um, to mistakes. That was, I, I, you know, that was really firming up. Now, who was responsible for this hype that was appearing in these press releases? Well, um, what Chris found was that when scientists were not involved, um, there were exaggerated claims in about 60% of the press releases that were going out. And um, when scientists did get involved, I mean, that did drop, that went down to about 40%. Okay, 40% of press releases when scientists were on hand and worked with the press office, 40% uh, still contained hype. But the remarkable thing is that when scientists wrote the press release, about 30% still contained hype. And and he also, you know, he said, so, you know, he also asked scientists, well, who, who do you blame for bad coverage of your of your work? And guess what? 100% of scientists blamed journalists for the coverage. Um, they blamed the newspaper. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, a, thir a third of scientists, uh, you know, took some of the uh, blame themselves. And as you can see, um, the university press office and the journal press office also um, uh, are labeled as culpable. Now, um, a couple of years later, when um, Chris had uh, done some more work on this, he produced a very long thread on Twitter. This is now back in 2018. So he really followed this up. And um, he came up with some advice for, uh, for scientists. And I'm, uh, I'm going to go through that because, by and large, I agree with a lot of it. First, he says, if you insist on checking journalists' copy before they publish, get used to never talking with the good ones. It makes you sound pedantic and untrusting, and you are only ensuring that your work is either never covered or is only covered by journos who lack confidence. Second, sometimes journalists check their copy or sections of it, um, to be sure that they've got a particular fact correct. It happens to me, he says, maybe 5% of the time. And that's fine if it's their choice, but never impose that as a condition of engagement. Now, on his third point, he says, don't ask to check quotes. And here, Chris is actually much more hard line than most journalists, I think. Um, I think... It's fine to ask um, to check your, you know, if they're going to quote you in a piece, I think it's actually fine to ask a journalist to see those quotes before. What we're talking about really here is um, asking to see the entire story that they've written about you when they're under immense, uh, usually deadline pressure. Um, he says, don't ask to check uh, quotes. Instead, if you have prior concerns, tell them you are recording the interview at your end for your records. If they misquote you, tell them to correct it. Yeah, um, especially as uh, a lot of news is online anyway. Um, that's fair enough. If they won't, publish the transcript, tell their editor, and never talk to them again. Well, if you have, um, you know, if you have the time to do that, uh, then uh, feel free. I think nowadays um, you probably uh, get just as much joy by just emailing the journalist you spoke to and um and correcting the record yourself on twitter or something like that um but um yeah i mean tread tread carefully but um be firm um i think it's actually pretty rare for most of the reputable newspapers and magazines to to misquote people anyway i don't think that's a uh, a huge problem fourth um chris says if you really want accurate science news, avoid exaggeration in your own press releases and anticipate likely misunderstandings by including a section. 
what this study does not show. If you allow hype in your PR, then you share culpability for misreporting. And finally, he says, accept that you're not special to journalism and neither is science. Independence is key to journalism. Sometimes journalists will screw up and sometimes you will do it all by yourself. Get media trained, find the good journos and trust them and basically get over yourself. Yes, um, all good advice. Good advice for everybody. Now, um, what to do if you encounter a journalist in the wild? Well, um, if you think your research um, might get press attention, then um, talk to your press office nice and early and get any training that they offer beforehand. Um, be confident, you know, you know your research best. You certainly know it better than any of us. Um, so uh, just uh, try and make sure that you can explain the work clearly to a dunce and um uh and uh, and practice with a dunce that is with a friend who can ask stupid questions because that's what journalists do for a living we ask stupid questions you answer them and then we write our stories uh the next point seems kind of obvious right it says don't say anything that isn't true uh, but what i mean by that is um and i've run into it this is um, caused me more grief than um, almost anything else uh, with with sources who um, do not have, say, a number, a stat to hand. And so they say something fairly confidently and um, you go away, you might um, quote them. And then it turns out that uh, they got it wrong. So instead of just saying, actually, um, I don't know that, uh, but I'll email you with it, which is perfectly acceptable. As long as you do, then email them with it or text them with it. Um, you know, they just they just say, oh, it was about this. And then that turns out uh, not to be true. And that can introduce errors because many of the dailies, most of them do not have fact checkers on hand. They don't have time to fact check who will take a look at your paper, go through it and compare that to... Um, uh, to uh, to what you said or to what another scientist said. Now, uh, you know, I know for a fact the Economist does have brilliant fact checking, and so does Nature. Uh, so does Nature, and uh, I don't know too much about science's processes, but there are a few places um, that um, uh, run a very detailed fact checking operation. But the thing is, you know, the the Economist is a weekly. And, um, you know, if nature can't um, have a good fact checking unit, then who can, right? Um, so don't say anything that isn't true. Uh, have a couple of pithy quotes ready, um, not too cheesy. And now I have encountered researchers who um, have clearly been drilled in this element uh, to to uh, have their quotes ready and then they repeat them ad infinitum during the interview and it sounds very wooden and the quotes aren't that great anyway so what do I mean by pithy quote? well something that kind of summarizes what you think are kind of the take-home messages of the research in in uh, some nice quotable way um, and the rest of the time, you'll probably end up um, just running through your, you know, your results and methodology anyway, which um, that, that, it's, uh, that will come pretty easily. Now, um, it is OK to talk to a journalist about a preprint, but just um, when if this does happen and if you are approached by a journalist, uh, you know, if somebody phones you up or emails you saying saw that um, paper on archive and I'd like to chat to you about it. I'd like to do a story on it. Um, just, uh, you know, mention that, uh, you know, the work hasn't been peer reviewed. And that is um, an essential caveat for them to include. Now, if they have taken the step of searching through archive, looking for stories on their patch anyway, they probably are aware of this. But it's, you know, it, it can't do any harm to remind them of that. 
Um, you won't get into any trouble um, for that. And if there are if there are journalists from a reputable newspaper or um, a magazine like Nature, what we tend to do is we go out and find a kind of independent scientific sources, ask them to read the paper and see what they think. Um, and I have been told by several scientists that when we do that, and when we get back to them with questions, it's like it, it's it's kind of like a mini peer review process. So um, good science journalism can um, feel a bit like you're going through peer review early. Sorry. Um, conference presentation. Um, a conference presentation is fair game. If you are at a conference, you present some exciting work and then a journalist approaches you afterwards. Um, this is OK. Uh, they are doing their job. Um, if you think this might happen, um, you know, contact the conference organizers beforehand and say, are there going to be journalists about? And if so, you know, have, uh, you know, that chat with that press office and uh, and be prepared. Now, bear in mind that if you just walk off in a half or say, oh, I don't want those results reported, the likelihood is that they will report them anyway because you've given a presentation, right? So, um, uh, you know, they, they can write that up and they will write that up without your participation, which um, will not necessarily be um, good for the story and you will, you know, uh, miss out on um, your, or, you know, they will... Uh, they will drop the story and then you will miss out on your work being covered. So uh, bear that in mind. Now, there is a big, big caveat, and which is do not promote unpeer reviewed preprint or unpeer reviewed work um, to the press yourself, right? Don't push your press office to do so. Um, or the back. And this is because of something known as the Inglefinger rule, which you may have heard of. And essentially what this says is that if a journal feels that you have published your work in some way, and that could include a newspaper, if you've, um, you know, you pushed for some sort of coverage of that work, then they may decline to accept it. And this has happened. This happened whilst I was at Nature, where back half editors said, well, you know, um, you issued this press release about the work, and then you talked to the BBC and so on. So we're not going to take that work anymore. OK, um, so don't do that. Um, it would be a shame to miss out on an nature babe, wouldn't it? Uh, or uh, because uh, because, uh, you know, you sent out a press release um, and stay calm. Um, and just bear in mind that if a journalist has time to go to a conference and, and report on it, then they're probably one of the better ones, because frankly, many of the ones at uh, dailies just uh, don't do that. Um, Okay, right. Well, thank you very much for listening. And thank you so much, Anonio. That was really helpful. I'm sure our participants agreed. Um, and now we can officially open the floor for any questions that um, our attendees have. So feel free to either um, type them in the chat um, and then I can um, address them one by one. But maybe until some of the questions come, I, I had a question on on you, if that's okay. Um, so over the years, I've spoken to a lot of scientists as well. And many of them have expressed to me or confided in me that they believe that their research isn't really relevant enough or their findings are not significant enough to share with the media. Um, and interestingly, some have even said this to me after journalists have approached them for comments or interviews. So certainly there is interest. Um, yeah. But then maybe they feel that, you know, um, if they comment, maybe their colleagues might have something to say about it, or there's something that's still holding them back. So yeah. um, what advice do you have for scientists to just sort of keep an open mind about this? Yeah, um, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, so, and there is a, I can't, not seeing the wood for the trees, I think, um, thing going on there. And of course, um, you know, as researchers, uh, researchers live in fear of the <laughs> condemnation and judgment of their peers. And um, it is, of course, extremely important in science. Nobody's saying it's not. Um, uh, what I would say is that um, 
when you produce a piece of work, you're not necessarily the best qualified to say how interesting it is. I, I mean, I get the other side quite a bit, which is that, you know, researchers absolutely are absolutely convinced that their latest paper is of massive public interest, but then they're surprised when journalists aren't remotely interested in, in covering it. So I think, you know, often um, researchers are, are a bad judge. And, you know, it th th this is partly what the press office is there for. You know, you go to the press office, you go, OK, I've been approached to talk about this, um, but I just don't think it's newsworthy. And, and you know, and talk it through with them. Um, I think it's, it seems what what is likely here is that they're possibly afraid that their findings will be exaggerated, um, perhaps, in which case the answer is probably just to kind of um, kind of damp things, you know, just when you talk to the journalist, do talk to the journalist and then, you know, just stick to what you think are the main points and then you know if they don't then after that if they don't think it's a you know it's a story they're not interested in um producing a story that won't be read uh, i mean you know, you you've one thing that journalists are quite good at is um is find, you know finding stories that are of interest to their readership so and something that might be of huge interest to say readers of nature will you know might not be of any interest at all to readers of i don't know the daily mail or the guardian or the, or the telegraph um uh, and so on um the other thing is you know um bear in mind that if a journalist is really interested in a piece of work that you've produced that's been published or is otherwise in the public domain then they can just go ahead and cover that and i you know i've i've done that once or twice because the researcher just said oh no, i'm not going to talk to you about this in which case you go off you read the paper um you send the paper to um other people in the field who uh, you say would you mind reading this and talking to me about it and then you write that story without the contribution of the person who produced the work um now and which is which is less than ideal but you know you know that if a, if a piece of work is sufficiently interesting um, and you found it, then it's quite likely that another journalist, maybe one that isn't as good as you, will also find it and uh, make a make a worse job of reporting it. So um, that's if the you thing. Are... Um, sorry to cut you off, yeah, but yeah. I mean, every journalist has a different way of being inspired or maybe looks for different hooks from the same research. So you never yeah. know what might actually um, pique someone's interest. Um, so to that end, it's just important to just try to be available and try to be accessible to journalists because they might have a story that maybe you did not see coming at all from your Yeah, book. yeah, quite. Um, and it could be that um, your research is sort of part of a bigger puzzle. It might be part of a feature, for example, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, so, you know, try not to, re uh, you know, to, to, uh, to prejudge. I mean... I would say obviously there are um some newspapers you know if you hear from them I won't name names and if you if you hear from them then you're probably right to be cautious um but everybody knows which ones they are um so you know again take advice from the press office and decide um but just bear in mind that you know if if you don't talk in these situations then you know they've they've got the press release and the story will be based on the press release um if if um you know if that's the case which you know you may decide that's you, you that's all that's all you want out there you don't you don't want to engage any further um uh i think sometimes um it can um kind of really lift a story um if the scientist um is involved um but uh, sometimes, you know, um, it's possible that, um, a, a, you know, for a couple of newspapers that, that their agenda may override, um, you know, your caution. Um, so, but, but we, you know, we know who they are. And, um, you know, so I uh, decide on on a case by case basis and if you build up a good relationship with a journalist you know that's all that's always good if you if if you are repeatedly producing work that is of public interest if you're an area an exciting area um then um you know that's that that can work very well for both of yeah. you 
And the important thing is to just start with building those relationships, really, and um, hopefully take it from there. It's a lifelong process, really. Um, we have another question that's come in. Uh, what key advice would you give a press officer to help scientists feel more comfortable talking about their work? Gosh. <laughs> well, I have never worked as a press officer, so that's... Um... It's an interesting question. I think, actually, um, uh, perhaps one thing is, you know, the um, kind of the, you know, behave like a journalist. And so I'll ask the stupid questions. Um, and, um, you know, once they've run through that and once a scientist has sort of explained their research a couple of times, I think, you know, people will tend to relax you know they might have a few notes in front of them or whatever some talking points you know those uh those pithy quotes um if a press officer were able to do that then um i think that will diffuse a lot of the a lot of the nerves and of course do work with the scientist when you are preparing that press release um that you know uh, scientists so some scientists can't necessarily you know they won't necessarily be able to write for lay people they you know they may not see the most exciting or interesting part of their research um uh from a you know from the point of view of the general public if you like they might be they might have latched on to what they think is important as a scientist but they might not see you know that um other than, and clearly it's the press officer's job to um to kind of bring that out and um do 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 the uh, hand holding and uh, make sure that um, you know uh, that they don't get overexcited and start exaggerating their own results as well, which apparently um, has been known to happen. Uh, I hope that's is that helpful. I sure hope so, and that's actually a good segue into our next question, uh, which is um, coming in from Yasmin, uh, who asks. How would you communicate existing uncertainty in climate science or indeed any other scientific field to a journalist in a way that this uncertainty is propagated to the general public without rendering the entire story unimportant? Wow. Um, yeah, that's that's a very big question. I mean, I personally um, have edited climate science, but I haven't covered very much of it myself. But I think in some ways the problems are not so different with areas of medical research, for example, where, you know, you will have a finding in, say, rats and um, it's it's reported as if, you know, tomorrow there's going to be some treatment for humans off the basis of, of this work. Um, it's about kind of um, bringing in the caveats, I guess, without totally ruining the story. I mean, if you have to put so many caveats into the work that actually it's so tenuous that um, you can barely say anything um, that is uh, of wider interest without a um, hundred caveats, then you have to wonder, is that work ready to be shared more, wi more widely? But if, you know, um, what you mean is, uh, um, uh, you know, these are projections of likely uh, but not certain um, outcomes, then I think you say something along those lines. You give, um, well, how likely do we think, um, you know, this is this this will come about? And you give some indication of that, um, which is, I know, difficult, but I think that's really what you've got to do. You've got to come up with some uh, way of communicating that uncertainty by um is there is there, is there a you know it's more likely than not or or whatever um of um uh yeah uh, of saying that or or point you know to um if you can to how past predictions have fared and say well you know this is this is what was said and this is what happened and um, there are you know that, that's um that as a as a layperson myself in this area that that would be um interesting to me um yeah and distinguish what is truly 
an absolute, you know, strong consensus in the field from, you know, the what are more tenuous findings and, you know, and and distinguish between them as um as uh as you're talking uh and again you know the daily you know the the times will probably the times reporter will probably pick up on that and there are there are some there are some that won't and um so you know as chris said um that section in your press release which says this is not saying this i think that could be very handy for uh, a contentious area like climate science for example and then you can always say you know why did you say that in the story it clearly said here <laughs> this isn't what the research showed for sure um you know in that press release if you can work in um you know there's a x percent chance or whatever uh, uh, this is true or you know or or do or put your comparisons there then the journalist has it right in front of them and your chances of actually getting those caveats into the story are much higher than if you count on them that talking to you which they may or may not do um but you know if they have that right there on the press release that then there's no excuse right no matter what deadline pressure they're under you've already put those uncertainties if you like and expressed them in a palatable way um for them to then stick in their new story you. Um, before we proceed to the next question, maybe Anonyo, if you um, could stop sharing your screen so that we have a uh, chance to um, see you in yeah. full screen. That would be really yeah, nice. Yeah, sorry. Just to uh, get the q &A going. Yeah, there we are. Okay, great. So um, our next question is from Matteo, who says, is there any point approaching specific journalists once the press release is out, assuming the release has been ignored? Oh, is there any? Blah, blah, blah. Um, well, as a journalist, I'd probably say no, because there's nothing more annoying <laughs> than, um, than, you know, you've had your news meeting, stories have been mulled over and talked about with the team and the editor, and you're off writing and then, um, and then you're, you're approached by, um, a scientist who says oh my paper's come out and um and you haven't covered it um you know why haven't you done it but um you know there are a lot of press releases that go out and if your paper isn't appearing in one of the really big journals in your field one you know or you know like nature or science or proceedings of the national academy of sciences all of these journals that have very organized um uh press release um routine so so for example um uh nature for example will release a early embargoed um press releases of all of the papers that they identify as being newsworthy and they do a brilliant job um Journalists will get those early, several days um, early, and often um, they will have the meeting um, a couple of days earlier. It's one of the things that makes science journalists lazy is the is the embargo press release because you you do get that uh, from time to time in in other areas in you know whatever in political reporting you might get a, a report under embargo from a committee or something like that uh, but in science this happens a lot because uh you know the 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 journals are very dominant um on that now if your paper isn't in one of the big journals with a very um uh organized um press office which journalists check as a matter of routine and if it's just gone out as a press release from just your university then um uh sure it might be and you're and you're convinced that this is a big story then sure it is worthwhile sending out um a couple of emails what journalists really like that i should say is an exclusive so if you have some sort of if you have a favorite journalist or if you have um uh a couple of people that you've uh worked with before then i would say 
kind of send it to them, um, write a, you know, a very brief summary of why you think it's newsworthy and say, as far as I know, this research hasn't been picked up yet. And, uh, you know, if if you're right, um, and if, you know, you, you've, you've just been overlooked, you know, you've been lost in the news churn, then, you know, you might get lucky. And the journalist might go, aha, well, you know, this is, uh, this will be a bit of an exclusive for me. So I might, I might go for it. And that's happened to me as well. So um, it's, you know, I can't, I can't say that uh, you definitely shouldn't do it. But the chance, if, if your paper is coming out or has come out in uh, one of the big journals, the chances are that somebody will have looked at that um, and, um, and discussed whether to, um, whether to cover it. Um, now, if, uh, again, if like, if it's a nature paper that's just coming out and, uh, the nature press office has decided that it's not newsworthy, then they, and you think, well, that's just, that's outrageous. Um, uh, I, I really think it is. Again, it might be worth doing it. Now, the thing not to do is, um, break the journal embargo. Um, you can contact uh, a journalist, but don't share the paper with them and explain to them that the um, the paper is under embargo um, uh, and, uh, you know, they can't bring out the paper before. Now, the thing is, um, this is a, you know, this is a very, it's a, it's very sort of gray area because um, by telling them about the research before <laughs> embargo lifts you're also sort of breaking the embargo if they then go ahead and publish their story before the embargo lifts you know then um then they're then uh you're you're both kind of in trouble but uh most journalists most science journalists specialist uh, science journalists are all signed up to the embargo so they will not do that um yeah, the other thing not to do is if it's been weeks and your papers come out weeks ago, then um, you, you know the opportunity is probably uh, passed. Um, so if you're going to approach um, a journalist, um, then um, you know send that email, uh, you know, in the, it, on the day that the paper's coming out. Um, if you if you think it's uh, if it's been missed or as close to it as possible. And we have just one more question, I believe. Um, and to some degree, you've already answered some of this. What are some things that scientists should avoid saying or doing when talking to a journalist? Hmm. Um, uh, well, uh, this is a tricky one, but um, don't get lost in the weeds. Don't go into technical deep into technical details that won't appear but if if you feel that the journalist has sort of misunderstood some vital aspects of the paper um and it, it really is important then of course you know you should say actually um that's not quite right let me do that but don't get lost in the weeds don't expect you know this to you know the journal article is already the thing of record right that's the thing the records of your research and you can't expect a news article to produce every kind of uh key point on that it's gonna it's gonna it's a big picture thing it's going to say this is what it's about this is roughly what you know if you're lucky they'll say this is roughly what they this is what they did and uh, uh isn't it cool and here's here's what other scientists thought of it and and that's that's how it's going to go so so there's um there's that um respond in a, a timely way that's important if they've got more questions and they email you questions do try and don't don't disappear off into meetings or supervisions for the rest of the day and if you are then just check that phone from time to time in case there's a panic stricken question on the day and that's you know the the, the turnaround will usually be within about 24 hours so it's only the, the weekly magazines that uh are going to have more time than that uh, and even then they don't necessarily have that much more time but if your paper is coming out like later that day or in the afternoon you pretty much have to be available throughout that time um, so no matter where you are don't ignore your phone or you know don't don't do that because uh, that can that 
short window can lead to more errors than anything else because if the journalist doesn't know the answer to something you know they're either going to pull the story the editors are going to pull the story or they're going to just run with what they think is the right answer so uh, that's really important so be available in that time and again your press office i'm sure will impress the importance of that on you and yeah and don't you know as i said don't don't exaggerate the claims you don't have the confidence of the, of, of your work but no more um uh yeah so uh stay away from uh you know too 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 many te unnecessary technical details that you know don't confuse the poor journalist um be available so th those sorts of things i think um are probably the the most important um we've run we've run through so many of the don't don't say you know i demand to see the story before you publish it that is not going to be um a good approach because you'll instantly sour them and um that um that's probably not a good outcome for either of you um but yeah i mean um i think um the best stories tend to get um you know written when the researchers are pretty enthusiastic about their work um and uh you know a, a reasonably happy to to engage and um you know the press release has kind of your rules of engagement as it were it was the you know this this isn't what it's saying this is what it's saying and um if you stick to that um then it's fine uh, do you know just you know do try and make sure you don't say anything um because uh you know that uh, you, you want to be quoted you know and to de determined to be quotable and then you say something that you regret and then you're going to try and contact the journalist when they've written the story and go no 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 i i said that but i didn't mean it try you know uh try not to um try not to uh, uh veer off veer off course um because uh you know the better ones will kind of go hmm, are you sure you are you sure you really meant that uh you know but but some who are in a hurry will just go okay right fine write it down the story's filed in 20 minutes and then they're on to the next one so yeah okay thank you so it doesn't look like we have any more questions and we've got a whole lot of important takeaways from you and your talk and on your um if you would like to leave us with any last few words or a take-home message otherwise we are ready to conclude our webinar for today okay no uh just thank you very much for having me it was fun i hope uh hope everybody uh learned something and uh also <laughs> found it fun as well thank you Thank you so much. My only takeaway message to everyone is if you don't know who your press officer is or who's in charge of your institution's media relations, maybe that is a good place to start now because um, that could really get the ball rolling for any sort of media communication that you want to do in the future. So all the best to everyone. And we are now ready to conclude our webinar. So thank you everyone again and I wish you a good day ahead.